We're going to look at the first module, which consists in the revision for linear algebra, which is at the core of many, many methods employed in the realm of machine learning. OK, if you want to go into deeper detail in what we're going to cover here, you can go in the book for the class Probabilistic Machine Learning for Civil Engineers. So first, we're going to see linear algebra because we can see this as the foundation for all the method we're going to develop next. OK, so really, even if it's if it's clear in your mind uh, or if linear algebra is clear in your mind, you can skip over. If you want to be sure to have all the basics for what's uh, to come, please uh, listen carefully to what we're going to cover here. So first, we're going to introduce the notation associated with linear algebra for variable, vector, matrices, etc. Then what are the operation we can do with these elements? Uh, things specifically that we're going to reuse later on, such as norms. What is the norm of a vector? What can we use that for? Uh, we're going to see something which is transformation. How can we uh, represent transformation using linear algebra? And what's the meaning of those transformations? And finally, the last thing is Egan decomposition, okay, which is uh, intrinsically related to the transformation we're going to look at. So now we're looking at the first uh, here revision related to uh, linear algebra, okay, the first uh, revision module. So first thing with respect to notation. So the tricky thing we're going to cover are pretty basic, scalar, vector, and matrices, okay? First thing when we refer to a scalar, we refer to a single number. For instance, lowercase x here would be a scalar. We could say, for instance, that scalar belongs to the real space, okay, from minus infinity to plus infinity. It could be a belonging to the real positive space, so from the interval in z between zero and plus infinity. It could be uh, the, um, the um, integer space from this set of possible integer between minus infinity and plus infinity. Or it could be any other interval or subset of value. For instance, it could be the interval between 0 and 1, including both 0 and 1, or 0 and 1, which this represent excluding 1. Then we might want to deal with multivariate coins. So in that case, we can use and represent these multivariate quantities in arrays. In this case, we can have a one-day array is going to be a vector. So uh, x lowercase x bold is going to be represented as a vector. So sometimes if you write on the board or you write in your notebook, you might not be able to do bold letter. What you're going to do, x with an underline, okay? <coughs> Sorry. In that case, you're going to be referring to a vector. So vector by definitions are always column, okay? In that case, I have n term in my column vector, okay? So that x bold or x with that underline would be that n element vector. So we could represent by saying here, I want to access the ith element from that vector. So I'm going to use these brackets to say I'm in, uh, referring to the ith element from my x vector and i'm saying this element belongs to the real space and this is valid for all i belonging to the set from one up to n okay in a more short uh short in a shorter form we could also equivalently say that my vector x belongs to the real space in n dimension okay both will be equivalent then we can extend this to matrices. So two-day arrays that will contain numbers or scalars, okay? So lowercase x bold was a vector, uppercase x bold will be a matrix. If you write in your notebook, I suggest use the underlying notation when you write by hand to denote a, a matrix or a vector. So in that case, vector with a single column, here it's gonna be an array, okay? With M column and uh, M line and N column. Okay, so the first index in a matrix is always the row number. The second index is always the column number. So in that case, we can access the ith and jth element of the matrix X by saying these are defined. Each of those are defined in the real space for all i uh, belonging from one to M and all j. So all line from 1 to m, and I'll column j from 
1 to n. Or we can jointly represent my matrix X belongs to the real space in m times n dimensions. There are special matrices that we're going to be interested in. The first one is a square matrix. Okay, it's going to be a 2D array uh, containing again number or scalar, but has as many rows as columns. So if I have n, ro uh, n rows, I'm going to have n columns as well. Okay, so we can represent it element by element, or just simply by saying my X matrix is going to be defined in real space of dimension n by n. Then we can have diagonal matrices. Okay, in a diagonal matrix, 2D array containing numbers of scalar, where I only have non-zero term on the main diagonal. So this is the main diagonal here, and everything is uh, zero but that main diagonal. So in that case, I could say that if I do the operation diag of a vector x, it's like placing the term of that vector x on the diagonal of a square matrix, okay? So if I have n element in that vector, it's going to result in an n by n matrix. I could have the identity matrix. So that identity matrix is going to be a diagonal matrix where the non-zero term on the main diagonal are always 1, okay? Here I have an n by 1, n identity matrix. So 1 on the, on the main diagonal, 0 everywhere else. And we have a special property with that identity matrix. Okay, for instance, if I multiply a vector by the identity matrix, it remains the same vector. If I multiply the identity matrix by a matrix X, it remains the matrix X. Okay, so it doesn't change the result multiplying the identity matrix by a vector or a matrix. Then we're going to leave later on the concept of a block diagonal matrix. Okay, what is that? Imagine I have a first matrix A and a second matrix B, okay, defined as you can see here. So if I want to build a block diagonal matrix of A and B, it's simply we want to concatenate together on the main diagonal of a big larger matrix, my sub matrix A and B, as you can represent it here. Okay, so this is what we call a block diagonal matrix. So now let's look in more detail at the operation we can do uh, for scalar L, uh, vectors and matrices. So the first thing we're going to look at is related to the transposition of a matrix. So let's imagine that we have a matrix X made of those elements. So the indexes, the first index here refer to the uh, rows, the second index to the column. So it means, in this case, first row, second column second row, third column, okay? If I take the transpose of that matrix, it's equivalent to permuting the indexes in my original matrix. So now I have one tree. It's a permutation of that one tree here, okay? So now it's becoming the third row, first column, okay? So this is what we obtain if we take the permutation operation. Now we can say, as uh, I just mentioned earlier, the i and j element of a transpose matrix is like equivalent to permuting the indices of that same matrix. And that, the most useful operation is going to be matrix multiplication. Okay, let's say we have the matrix C, which is obtained by the product of A and B. So Either if we write it like this without any symbol or with a cross, it means the same thing, okay? It's going to be a matrix multiplication. So in that case, the matrix multiplication is defined as the i and j, -th, so the i -th row and j -th column of my matrix C is going to be equal to the sum over k for the element a i k times b k j. So notice that it's the inner indices that are summed over, okay? So here we have to uh, pay attention on the dimension. So if my uh, final matrix C is of size M by N, okay? It requires that my matrix A is gonna be M by K, and B is K by N. And where you see that the second index here is the same as the first index here. So at the end, the final product of my matrix is gonna be the first index by the second index. And it's absolutely required that the last and first index here be exactly the same. So visually, how does it look like? So here I have a matrix A, I have a second matrix B. So if I want to do A times B, 
For instance, in order to obtain that C, I, J, so C, 1, 2, this is what I'm obtaining here. So it's going to be, I take the first row from A and the second column from B. So first row, second column. So first row for A, second column for B. And I do an element-wise uh, multiplication and then sum all the terms. So A11 times B12 plus A12 times B22. So this is what I obtained here. So if I take, I want to obtain C43, I'm going to take the fourth row from A and the third column from B. So A41 times B13 plus A42 times B23. The output is going to be C43. Okay, and you can do that for any element in the resulting matrix C. There are some operation rules for uh, multiplication. For instance, there's the distributivity. So if we say we have A times B plus C, so in that case, I can say this is equivalent to A times B plus A times C. If I have A times B times C within the parentheses, I can move the parentheses over. So I can say I'm going to do uh, as a priority A times B and the result times C. This is the associativity property. Then with matrix multiplication, the order matter. OK, it means doing A times B is not necessarily equals to B times A. OK, this is not com a commutative operation. Then if you do A times B transpose, it's going to be equal to B transpose A transpose. This is a property named conjugate transposability. Then you can take the inner product of vectors. So before these, these, all these were matrices because they were uppercase. These are vectors now because they're lowercase. OK, so the X transpose is a row vector times the column vector Y is equals to x times y, the inner product, okay? That dot is not the same as the matrix multiplication, okay? It means I'm going to multiply element by element all the terms x and y, and then sum them over, okay? What our x transpose y or that dot product here have the same meaning. Linear algebra is really widely used because it's a convenient representation for linear system. OK, what's a linear system? So here's a visual representation of what could be a trivial linear system. A function y equals ax plus b, where a is a constant, b is a constant. So in this case, this is a relationship between a variable x and a variable y, OK, represented by this line here. So in this case, it takes the form y equal ax plus b, where a equal 3, b equal 1. OK, but you can generalize this concept of linear system not only to one dimension, but to as many input as you want, as many in output as you want. In this case, it's going to be one output two input. OK, so basically X is going to be X1, X2, a vector including two component. So A is also going to be a vector of two component. And B, since we have a single output, is going to be a scalar. So in this case, A is 1 times x1 plus 2 times x2 plus b equals to 3, okay? And this linear system actually describes this plane you're seeing here on the figure. So there's a special product that we're going to use, especially uh, when we're dealing with neural networks. It's the element-wise product, okay? We're going to say we have two matrix A and B, which are of same size. So if we do that uh, operation, which is a dot, inside a circle is going to be the element wise product. So C is going to be the same size as both A and B, and it's going to be simply an element wise multiplication. So the element, for instance, 1, 1 of A is going to multiply the element 1, 1 of B. And this product is going to become the element 1, 1 of C. So basically, the I and J out of C is going to be the element wise product of the I and J, I and J, I, I and J term of A times the i and j in terms of b. So we can do the same thing uh, for the whole matrix. And you see that for both a, b, and c, they all have the same sizes in terms of matrix. A uh, really common operation is the inversion, OK? Uh, what we have to see is if we multiply the inverse of a matrix with the matrix itself, the result is always the same. It's going to be our identity matrix, OK? 
But to be invertible, a matrix must be square and must not have linearly dependent either rows or columns, okay? So for a system of linear equations, let's say AX equal B, the, the goal is often to, to retrieve, okay, what are the values of X for that system? So in that case, we can use that matrix inversion. So we're gonna say, okay, here I'm gonna multiply on both sides of the equality by A inverse. So A inverse A times X is gonna still be equal to A inverse times B. But we see here for that, in that identity we've defined earlier that A inverse A is given identity. So now we've isolate X equal A inverse B, okay? So that allow us to solve system of linear equation. Now we're gonna see the concepts of norm, okay? Norms are there to measure our large a vector s, okay? But there's not a, a sing, there's not a, only one way to measure a large a vector s, okay? In a general way, we can define the LP norm. The LP norm is defined as here as these two pairs of double lines uh, with subscript P, which is defined as the sum over I of all the components of my vector X, the absolute value of it to the power of P, and uh, the result of that sum is to the power one over P, okay? This is the LP norm. The special case that we're interested in is, for instance, the L2 norm. L2 norm, also known as the Euclidean norm, is going to be the square root, remember, is to power 1 over 2 of the sum over all the elements of my vector x, each put to the power 2, okay? This is the Euclidean norm. Then we can have also the Manhattan norm. So, for instance, here we're going to simply sum all the absolute value of each element in my vector. We could have also the L infinity norm, which corresponds to the max norm. So basically, we're just going to take the maximum component of my vector in absolute value, okay? The, the value that has the higher magnitude. So if you want to illustrate these norm with this vector, so I have a two-dimension uh, vector, uh, or I have a vector in a two-dimensional space with, with respect to x1 and x2. So we have these two decomposition. Now, I want to calculate that L2 norm, so the Euclidean norm. So it's going to be x1 squared plus x2 squared, square root of this. If I want the Manhattan norm, it's going to be x1 plus x2 in absolute value. If I want the L infinity norm, the max norm is going to be the longest of x1 and x2. It's going to be x1. Okay, these are different norms. And keep in mind, what are we going to do with this? In machine learning, what we want to do is to have our, a, a very generic model, okay? That can represent pretty much anything. And we want to learn what shape that model should take by minimizing the difference between the response of a system and the prediction from a model, okay? So what we want to do is to learn what are the parameters of that generic model by minimizing the distance between the prediction of the model and the observed value. Okay, so this is where later on in the course, the concept of norm is going to be used to measure the distance between the prediction made by our machine learning model and the actual observations. So we're going to see later on the most common norm is going to be the Euclidean distance is the one that is the most widespread. We're going to see later on why this one is so useful in our context. Now we're going to look at transformation. OK, uh, we're going to look at linear transformation, which are, are closely related to linear system and the concept of a determinant. So I've represented an example that we're going to use to explore a concept of linear transformation. So we have a two dimensional space with X1 and X2. And on that linear space, I've purposefully draw this uh, circle with one unit radius, okay? So how do you draw a circle? So here explicitly, I calculate for many discrete point in range minus one to plus one, what is gonna be the coordinate for my circle, given that I know what is the, its equation. So I do this as uh, the square root of one minus the coordinate x1 defined here, okay? So now I have a set of points, x1 and x2 as defined here, 
for my entire circle, okay? So this is what I've drawn here. Now what I want to say is let's apply a, transform, a space transformation on that representation. What is going, we're gonna explore what's going to happen. So right, right now we're gonna say, okay, my transform space X prime is gonna be A times, in this case, X transpose. Okay, to, to be sure that this one is a vector. So, uh, I don't know, this is still remaining matrix, sorry. But in this case, A is an identity matrix. So we saw earlier that an identity matrix times a matrix remains the same matrix. So in this case, X and X prime are exactly the same. And the determinant of my transformation matrix A is one, okay? What happens if I change the term in that transformation matrix? For instance, if I put two here, look at my initial grid here. If I put a two, you see that we're skipping a step here, okay? I change by a factor two my vertical scale associated with my second dimension. And look at what happened in my determinant. It went from one to two. What happened if I change, instead of changing a second term, I'm gonna change my first term. I'm gonna apply a transformation on my first dimension. And here, the scale of the stretch for my first dimension is gonna be 1.5. And now, my determinant is 1.5. Then I cannot only do one dimensional transformation, I can do joint bi-dimensional transformation. Okay, I can simultaneously transform my X and Y space. So in that case, if I put non-zero uh, off-diagonal term, I'm gonna jointly modify my two dimensions. So here I'm gonna squash my two dimension. Okay, and the determinant here is 0.75. What if I increase these value? My transformation is gonna be even more pronounced. Okay, and you see here, my determinant is even lower. So what do you see here is really how my original grid get transformed by that transformation matrix. So here, what is that interpretation for that determinant we keep seeing? So the determinant of a transformation matrix is always defined for a square matrix of size n by n. And the determinant is a mapping from that matrix to a scalar. And that scalar measure how much the matrix, my transformation matrix A, expand or contract the space. So if the determinant of a transformation matrix is one, it means that that matrix preserve the space or the volume, okay? For one dimension, I could the, reduce it by half, the other dimension, I could stretch it by half. The determinant would still be one. So not only the identity matrix as one as um, determinant. On the other hand, if the determinant is zero, it means that all the space collapse on itself. In the case of a 2D space, if the determinant is zero, it means that my two-dimensional space collapse on a line and is now a 1D space. It's a degenerate case. And how do we define the determinant of my transformation A is going to be the product of the Higgin value of that matrix. Okay, what's an Higgin value? We're gonna look at this by the concept of Egan decomposition, okay? We're gonna look at some example and definition of the concept. So for a square matrix of size n by n, we can decompose that matrix into Egan vector, so uh, new one to new n, and Egan values, lambda one to lambda n. So in their matrix form, you're gonna call V, is going to be a collection of all the Egan vector, and lambda ball is going to be the, the vector of Egan values. So if I have n Egan vector, I'm going to have n Egan values. And we can say that we can reconstruct the original matrix A from the Egan vector and Egan values by saying V times a diagonal matrix from our um, Egan vector lambda times the inverse of our uh, Egan matrix V. So we can define a matrix as being positive definite if all Egan values are greater than zero, and a matrix is going to be positive semi-definite if all Egan values are greater or equal to zero. And the concept of positive semi-definiteness 
is going to be uh, employed when we're going to look at a multivariate protein density function in the module uh, two of this class. So for positive semi-definite matrix, we can say that for all vector x, the product AX transpose AX is going to be always greater or equal than zero. And this is a key character characteristic when we're going to look at covariance matrix, matrices that uh, require to be positive semi-definite. Okay, so if we look at the transformation we had early on, if our transformation matrix is this one, this is the result of the transformation. And when we perform Egan decomposition, okay, what we're going to look at is how can we change the reference coordinate in our setup? Be, instead of being x1 or x1, x2, I'm going to have a new reference coordinate being v1 and v2. Okay, so here my Egan vectors represent my new coordinate system. And the lambda value represents the scaling in that new orthogonal co coordinate system. OK, so I want to find a new coordinate system in which the transformation from my space are independent of each other. OK, in that case, the Egan vectors are given by my matrix V and my Egan values are given in my vector lambda here. So again, that V1 here is my first new coordinate. V2 is my second coordinate defined by my Egan vectors. Lambda 1 here, lambda 2 represent the scaling in that new coordinate space. So in summary, for the linear algebra revision, we saw matrices. So if we want to do transposition, we permute the indices inside my matrix. If we want to multiply a matrix, C equals A times B. Same thing, whether we use the cross or not, we're referring to the operation of matrix multiplication. So matrix multiplication, we're going to say the i and j, the i -it and j -it term of my matrix C is going to be the sum over k of the a k -it terms times the uh, for the matrix A times the b -it and j -it term for my matrix B. So at the end, if A is m by k and k and b is k by n, then C is going to be m by n. Uh, we can have element-wise product. So if I want to say C equals A, the O dot, and B, this is equivalent to say the I and J terms of C is equal to the product of the I and J terms of A times the I and J terms of B. Uh, okay. Matrix inversion, we've seen that if we uh, take the inverse of a matrix times itself is going to give the identity matrix. We have several norms to model or to measure the uh, size of a vector, either the Euclidean norm, so the sum of the square of each term in the vector, square root of that sum. And this is the most common. We have also the max norm, the largest in absolute value term in my vector. We could have the L infinity norm, uh, which is going to be the sum of the absolute value in my vector. Uh, okay, determinant. Uh, the determinant is going to measure how much my matrix A contract or expand the space. Okay, so the determinant goes from uh, uh, n by n space or define or n by n space defined by my matrix and return a scalar. Okay, that measure how much that matrix transform my space. So if it's one, it means no change in the space. If it's zero, it means my space completely collapse uh, on its own. And finally, we can look at the Egan decomposition of a matrix as a reorganization of my reference where the transformation with respect to each axis are independent of each other. And this is related to the concept of a positive semi-definite matrix that we're going to reuse later on which says that for any vector x, the product x transpose times a times x is always greater or equal to zero.